There is a need for the world to focus on sustainable energy. We all know that. But that sustainable energy future is quite a way off at the moment. We can't store it. We might be able to produce it, but I don't think anybody wants to see a whole land mass full of windmills right up and down the Queensland coast. Nor do we want to see the whole of inland Australia turned into glass. There has to be a, uh, a more sustainable way of producing a sustainable future. And I agree with you. I want these young people to, to stick around in school to make sure that they get the smarts to get us out of this. Let's make the best use we possibly can of the best coal that we've got right here on our doorstep. Welcome to the Beers with a Miner podcast. My name is Mad Mumsy and I've been driving the huge dump trucks in Australian open cup mines for over 10 years now. I wish I had a dollar for everyone who said to me, how does a little thing like you drive those big trucks? Oh, you must be rich. How do I get a job doing that? My mining friends are asked these questions all the time too. This is what started the Mad Mumsy journey to share stories and tips from living a mining lifestyle and to let others know what it's really like. Tune in each episode as I sit down for a relaxed chat, usually over a few beers with a fellow miner. Women and blokes with various experience, roles and opinions share their lessons and stories with you. Not everyone is cut out to be a miner, but why not? What does it take to thrive and survive in this industry? Now, let's dig in. Get it? Dig? Mining? Oh, I crack me up. Hello and welcome to episode 62 of the Beers with a Miner podcast. This one is a little bit different. It is a happy hour episode where I am chatting with our Mackay Mayor in his office, which you'll hear all about. But why was there a TV camera in our faces? Denmark TV contacted me and wanted to know about mining and why it's important to Australia and our regional towns because they were coming here to do a story about the drought. A random Facebook message changed everything. Was it legit? After some research and a little bit of translating websites <laughs> and also talking to the TV director in Denmark, a, an epic two-day adventure was about to begin for me. The program is similar to our ABC's Foreign Correspondent and SBS's Dateline. They wanted me to speak about how mining affects our country and our regional towns as they share a story about the drought here in Australia. What might be causing it? Denmark have no mining, so they can't relate to why we keep doing it. Just stop, you know, but there's more to it than that. Jacob, the director of the program, the one who reached out to me and now my new friend, lived here for four years. He did one year in Townsville and three in Bris Vegas when he was doing his journalist degree. I can't say journalist, journo. (laughs) When he was doing his journo degree years ago. So he certainly understands our culture. I decided that I wouldn't have agreed if it was another, oh, you're killing the reef, stop Adani perspective. I don't need that target on my back. And they also wouldn't be open to absorb my thoughts. They were, wouldn't have been ready for me, I didn't think. (laughs) So I was ready for a no. But after a chat on the phone to meet Jacob and find out their why, and also why me, it helped me decide. They didn't want just people in suits. They were looking for down-to-earth Aussies and somehow they came across some mad mumsy. After 30 hours travel and plane delays, they arrived in Mackay. They followed me with a video camera for two days. Whoa, that's like, you know, I always say I've got a good head for podcasting. (laughs) It all started with me interviewing the Mackay Mayor, Greg Williamson, for this podcast, The Beers with a Miner, in his office. No pressure, right? (sighs) Greg was so passionate about our area and was open and welcoming to our foreign guests as well, and I thank you for that, Greg. It was strange going to the Mackay Council headquarters with a camera crew and saying, "Um, I'm here to see the mayor. (laughs) It's still crazy even just to say it. 
After the interview, we drove through Paget, our industrial state, and the video dude, Mass, was in the passenger seat right next to me. Whoa, he was way too close, bud. And that's my bad side. But, you know, I drove through and shared some of the things that were there and why it's important as we were on our way to Haypoint and Dalrymple Bay so they could see some coal. The lookout was perfect and they had plans of getting a drone out. Uh, I don't reckon it's allowed, guys. We asked at security and yes, it is, I was right, it is protected airspace, but that would have been cool. (laughs) I did manage to get them close enough for some great footage at the public lookout near the jetty. The videographer, Mass, was so excited and I said, I've converted you to love coal. It was funny. Well, we thought so. I thought so. We headed back to the Mackay Marina Hotel where they were staying. I hadn't heard of it, but it used to be the Clarion, so it's changed hands just in case you didn't know. They headed up for a rest and um, I went to sales and watched the sunset with a schooner of Forex Gold. Yes, not a can, a glass, but I was being posh that day. (laughs) So there was still one day to go. On Saturday, we had a family and friends barbecue at the harbour. They filmed my special people in my life as we spoke on climate change, protesters, the drought and how we were all connected to mining in, in one way or another. After they all left, they had me out in the full sun, no hat or sunnies because of the light, and questioned me more about climate change and mining. Oh, I was going red, hey, and after half an hour I said, you aged me 10 bloody years. I can see more wrinkles already. <laughs> At least I could continue drinking my beer. After all, it's the Aussie way, we all agreed. I learned so much from the director, Jacob, and videographer, Mess. I'm inspired to do more videos and share my thoughts on our industry in a more public way. So look out, they just might have created a monster. You might actually start seeing me in person more often. They headed to a farmer in Broken Hill, and then we're going to hang out with the Royal Flying Doctors. I reckon the drought will hit them head on out there. Lucky I messaged them about daylight saving starting. It was the Saturday night and it was starting Sunday morning. They would have had another flight delay for sure as they didn't know. They really, they didn't know anything about it. Or they might have arrived early for their flight when they didn't need to. They actually needed more rest. You know, I don't know. I never know if it's are you going to be early or are you going to be late? Depends on what end of daylight saving it is because we don't have it here, do we, in Queensland. Apparently they will send the program link to me. I may or may not even share it with you. <laughs> I have to wait until I see what they did with all the footage because they'll only use a bit. If I do, you will know because you're in the Beers with a Minor podcast group on Facebook, aren't you? And... Um, Also, I'll share it in the show notes, which will be found at madmumsy.com forward slash beer 62. All right, that's enough of the grounding so you know what's going on. Let's get this happy hour episode with Mackay Mayor Greg Williamson in his flash office with a Denmark TV crew filming us underway. Let's dig in. Get it? Dig? Mining? (laughs) I crack me up. Hello and welcome to the Beers with a Minor podcast, Greg. It's great to finally be able to sit down and have a chat with you. Thank you very much, Leanne. It's great to talk to you too. And I I know you've been doing this for a long time, so it's tremendous to have you here in the office. Thank you. And it's a very swish office, I might say. (laughs) Well, I like it. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, We first met at the Galilee Basin Rally and got a selfie. I was pretty excited to get a selfie Mm -hmm. with the mayor. So you've got one job today. Don't let me leave here without that selfie. Okay, we'll do another one. Yeah. yeah. Follow up. (laughs) Follow up, that's right. And then a couple of weeks ago, we met at the suicide, the Be Kind Mm. Suicide Awareness Mm. Walk and um, at our wonderful Blue Water Key. So yeah, that that was a great day. And uh, w- this community puts a lot of effort into uh, suicide prevention and uh, and the recognition of raising the level of awareness of suicide. Because after the last downturn, uh, we saw a high incidence of uh, suicides in our district. 
and uh, and the level of domestic and family violence and drug and alcohol abuse. You know that that was a, a consequence of some of the downturn that we had in the district. So we're we're over a lot of that now, thankfully. And uh, and what we've got to do as a community is make sure that uh, we continue to talk about it. And that's that's where we met the last time. So it was good to see you there. Yeah, it was, and it was a great turnout too. So, um, and I thought then I've got to got to go and see the mayor, and then. I had these people who were in our office looking straight in my face with a camera as we speak. I'll do an introduction and explain what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, But these lovely fellas from Denmark, Mass and Jacob, who reached out to me because they want to know how mining is so important to our town and our country. And there's a lot of people back Mm. there who from what I understand, think, well, why doesn't Australia just stop mining? Yeah, you know, like, uh, and I understand that there's mm, not many mines in Denmark, so no. So uh, it's it's an important it's an important outreach for you know for the world citizens to understand what goes on in other regions. So fantastic to have you guys here. Really good to uh, have you in town and have you in our office. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Um, now, are you ready? Let's dig Let's in. Go. Let's dig into the episode. Get it? Mm-hmm. Dig. Oh, Mining. Uh, it's Friday <laughs> afternoon, oh, Leanne. We, we can't get too deep. <laughs> <laughs> so the most important question of the day is, as this podcast is called the Beers with a Miner podcast, I like to start these happy hour episodes with my guests sharing their favourite beverage and also their favourite time to enjoy it. It might be beer, wine, spirit, or perhaps even a cup of tea. Uh, what well, is yours, Greg? So my favourite beverage, I guess when I'm out, I don't drink much at all, and that's part of uh, a public office. But I like a beer, and I like a Han 3.5 when I'm out. But uh, at night, when I'm at home, generally around 11 o'clock at night, when I get a chance to unwind, uh, I don't mind a Clare Valley Shiraz. So that helps me unwind at night. So there you go. It's a bit of both. A Clare Valley Shiraz, so that's South Australian one. Absolutely, yeah. Or Margaret River. Margaret River's not bad too, but Australian reds you can't go past. I agree. I like to have a red wine with my dinner. But I, I do have notes here on this question is to uh, don't talk too much about this, especially about wine. Because <laughs> some of my podcast episodes, we go right into all about the wines and I'm from <laughs> South Australia originally, Greg. So uh, I, Well, there you go. Yeah, well, anything from the Valley Clare Valley or Barossa, yeah. absolutely outstanding McLaren Australian Valley. wine. Oh, McLaren yeah. Valley. Yeah, wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Right. One of my favourite wine growers uh, is, um, well, a favourite producer of red wine is Grant Birch. Oh, so wow. he's in the South Australian as well, so... Uh, it produces a really good, heavy uh, Shiraz. What are your thoughts, Greg, on what mining means to the Mackay region? Let's start there. Mining underpins uh, our regional economy by about 60%, so it means a heck of a lot. When you look at De- Dalrymple Bay and High Point, our biggest uh, coal exporting ports, there's just under 10% of the world's seaborne coal leaves our ports. So it's a hugely important sector of our regional economy. And as I said, it underpins about 60% of the regional GDP. And so it's very, very important. Now, we don't mine coal within the confines of Mackay Regional Council, but we certainly do supply all of the services that underpins the, re- the, the resourcing industry in terms of maintenance and facilities. And so that all comes out of Mackay, and all of the heavy-duty heavy, heavy duty engineering comes out of Mackay, and all of the maintenance services comes out of Mackay, and of course the export all comes out of the Mackay region as well. So it's a very, very important sector of our regional economy. I think when you're talking about mining too, you, you've got to understand what we export here. I know some of the world is saying we should be getting out of coal, but we export around 80% of our exports are metallurgical coal. Now, there's two types of coal. There's thermal coal, and that's the coal that you use to generate steam in a coal-fired power station which turns the generators, which generates electricity. That's thermal coal. Metallurgical coal is the coal that's used to produce steel. Now, there's nothing that's going to take the place of steel in the coming decades. So most of the coal that we export out of here, 80% of what we export is metallurgical coal. And we're not going to stop mining metallurgical coal. We have some of the best in the world in the Bowen Basin. So we're not going to stop mining metallurgical coal uh, in the world until somebody invents something that takes the place of steel or to manufacture steel 
not using metallurgical coal, and that's not been invented yet. So I think we've got to be a little bit circumspect when we talk about coal mining. So it's not quite as simple to say, let's get out of coal mining, let's stop coal mining. What we mine the most of is metallurgical coal. And as I said, we've got the best in the world right on our doorstep. So all of our 26 coal mines produce uh, metallurgical coal, and that's what leaves most, that's what the most of the tonnage that leave our port is that. Yeah, well said. <laughs> I knew you'd put it so well. Um, yeah, I just usually say we have really clean coal. We have some of the cleanest coal in the world, and the world isn't going to stop using coal in a hurry yet. Like, as you say, never say never. But um, if they don't get our coal, they'll get it from somewhere else. It's probably dirtier coal, which therefore creates more emissions. So our coal, if you're going to use coal, keep using ours. So the, the, there is no doubt that when you're talking about thermal coal, so that's coal that's you know used to produce electricity, burnt to produce electricity, there is no doubt in terms of the ash content and the calorific content of the coal that the coal, the thermal coal that does come out of our region in, in northern and central Queensland is some of the best coal in the world as well. And, and there are still being produced around the world coal-fired power stations. I think 300 of them went up last year. Mm. And everybody wants a sustainable future. There, there is no doubt about that, and we want it too. I guess what we're saying is that for the 20% of the thermal coal that we export, we know that it's about the best in the world. And if there's going to be coal burnt in coal-fired power stations and another 300 were put up around the world in in this last 12 months, if there's going to be coal burnt in a coal-fired power station, it needs to be the best you can get. Not the dirty coal out of Indonesia or not the dirty coal out of other places in Africa, which has a very, very high ash content and a low calorific content, which means it burns dirty and it produces much more carbon emission. So, you know, you just need to be a little bit sensible about this argument. Everybody wants to get out of coal burning to produce electricity in the future, but we need to be able to keep the lights on now until we can work out how to keep lights on in the future. And when you talk about countries like India, there's 300 million Indians who don't have access to electricity. And whilst they're, whilst they're actually putting up all manner of uh, deliverables in terms of electricity, the, the most efficient way a country like India can bring 300 million of their citizens out of electrical poverty is to burn coal in a new generation coal-fired power station. And they're also putting up massive uh, solar farms as well and they're putting up wind farms. But it's going to be this mixture until we can work out how we store next generation electricity. And until we can work that out efficiently, we're going to be faced with coal-fired power stations well into the future. So let's talk about it sensibly. Let's talk about getting the best coal in the world. Let's talk about new generation coal-fired power stations. If countries around the world who are bringing their citizens out of uh, electricity property, if they're bringing them out of it, they need to be able to be doing it in the best possible fashion at the moment. And really... You know, there's wind wind generators and there's solar generators, but we can't store that electricity. I mean, if Tokyo is one of the one of the biggest cities in the world that consumes electricity, if they were to use continual solar driven power or wind driven power, and we had six weeks of rain in a monsoon in Tokyo, there is there's not enough batteries in the world to store the power just to run that one city alone. So we need to be sensible about this argument. We need to say. Let's work together on this, not, not in opposite camps, not in an us and them situation. It is not an us and them. We're all in this together. And the future, the future has got to be sustainable. We all know that. But let's work out a pathway over the next generation or so to make sure that we deliver a sustainable future. And it's not shut off coal right now because there's two reasons. You can't do it in terms of metallurgical coal because there's nothing to take the place of that production for steel yet. And in terms of uh, thermal coal to produce electricity, we need to be using the best in the world, new generation coal-fired power stations that produce less emissions, use the best coal in the world, and work out a way in the future to get out of it. Oh, I love it. Love it. That's the, especially the, your thoughts on the working out a way for the future moving forward. And to me, when I see the... The, not all of them because some of them are older 
like you and I, uh, the protesters that are going around now and the coming out of school and things like that. So many of the miners that I uh, know now and uh, in contact with, oh, they should be in school trying to figure it out, do something about it. They're, you know, it, it, like you say, it, I don't want it to be an us and them either. But at the moment, that's how it feels. We're certainly a them in a lot of their, in their eyes. Yes, their protests are getting the world to talk about it, is getting me to do a podcast with you. We've got these guys here from Denmark want to talk about it. Um, but we also need, even in mining, they say, okay, let's not all at our pre-start have a whinge and carry on about what's wrong. If something's wrong, what can we do? What's the solution? So solution-based arguments um, or discussions are where I'm coming from. And it's good to hear that that seems to be where you're coming from, which hopefully means the council, our governments as well. Well, unfortunately, it's not all governments. Um, mm. What what has happened, as so often happens in you know large global issues like this, it gets politicised, and so you've got one party for and one party against, and and it is, shouldn't be a politically based argument. This is a community based argument, and I understand. I understand young kids today saying, you know, I'm concerned about my future. I understand that. Uh, I also I also sort of agree with you that. The best solution for these young people is to stay in school and become the scientists that get us out of this in the future because mm-hmm. there's, a, there's a huge path for the, all of society to travel. And, and we've also got to recognise the fact that we're looking at it from a third world point of view. Uh, sorry, from a first world point of view. It's the third world that we should be, that we should be really concentrating on because basically what we're saying to the third world now is you can't have these facilities like ours because we're going to shut off coal and we're going to stop the production of electricity by burning coal. You can't do that at the moment. We need to be able to bring the third world with us along this journey. We need to be able to say to countries like India and you know, half of Indonesia and all those, all those countries that don't have access to electricity, a lot of Africa, we need to be able to say to them, let us work out with you a way to energise your village. Now, that might be for the next 20 years a small new generation coal-fired power station until we build a battery big enough to store the power from solar power or wind power or wave power that, uh, that runs that village into the future. But that's the sort of expertise we need. There is not a battery built yet that can actually run Mackay, for instance. We'd have to have three football fields worth of the current batteries to to run Mackay. And here in Mackay, we've been producing about 30% of our demand electricity-wise sustainably for the last 25 years. Hmm. We have a cogen plant at uh, at our mills here in Mackay that produce electricity from bagasse. And that's uh, surplus to the demand of the sugarcane industry. And that gets fed back into the system. So we've been doing it for a long time. You know, we've been involved in the future sustainable energy system for a long time in our district. We've been producing ethanol as a byproduct of sugarcane in Serena since 1929. So you know, and and I can show you many, many uh, factories, uh, engineering factories in Paget, our major industrial estate, who are very, very clever in terms of their use of electricity. One engineering shop is completely off the grid, runs entirely by sustainable energy. So, we, you know, we are, we are kicking goals in that area as well. And so I'm, you know, I'm quite proud of the fact that, number one, we produce some of the, uh, you know, the best coal in the world here and it underpins our economy. I'm also proud of the fact that you know, we, we as a community, a regional community in Australia, are doing our bit for the sustainable future as well. So, you know... My message really is it's an us and us solution. Everybody wants a sustainable future. Let's work on it together. But the future that that we can see, sustainable, yes, but it's got to include coal for the next couple of generations because there's no way we're getting out of producing steel without coal. And really to produce electricity to keep the lights on until we work out how to keep the lights on in the future, we need coal right now. Mm. Um, you touched on Paget in that yes. little chat there. What a fantastic 
industrial area that's turning out to be, it just started to take off and then we had our downturn and then it just kind of sat there looking a bit sad on and off for a while, a few people hung around and now when you drive through, it's really growing. I, I just saw another big sold sign up there on the Bruce Highway when I drove past the other day and when we leave here, that's where we're going, a bit of a drive around Good. pageant Good. to show how much of the support industry is right there based in Paget, and then we're going down to Hay Point. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's where all the maintenance for the Bowen Basin comes from, and uh, that's where all of the technology advances over the last 20 to 30 years has come from. We have uh, the, the most number of patents in terms of the resourcing sector, in terms of coal mining uh, for Australia, are held out there in, in Paget, and that's for technological advances, that's for you know, new bits of uh, large equipment and small equipment that makes the coal mining industry or the resources in, or the resources sector tick. And a lot of that's been done out here in, in the Mackay region and particularly at Paget. And you'll find all the major OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, they've all got their headquarters out there as well. So, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a very, very high labour-intensive area. We've got a lot of people working in the industry out there. And it's great to see it backfiring on all cylinders again after... Yeah, you know, that last downturn that we had. That's right, and um, I I found a little block there the other day that I'm going to go to, and we've got the Greyhound buses out there, so they take a lot of the miners out to site. So that's a whole industry is transport to get get the miners out there, and then there's the tyres and rims and dragline buckets, and there's a a few of the big safety. Um, warehouses where you go and get all your PPE, personal mm-hmm. protective equipment, for those of you who don't know. That's right. Uh, there's a whole industry around training. There's yes. training industry. Uh, speaking of training industry, we've got an exciting new, um, oh, what was it Resource called? Resource Centre <laughs> of Excellence. That's it. I, so the council yeah. has, uh, has used um, about $3.5 million from the state as, a, as an election grant in this last state election, and we've had to put well, that and a little bit more to it. But uh, we're building a resource centre of excellence at Paget, just across the road from our depot at Paget. And that resource centre of excellence is, uh, is aimed at making the industry sector, the resources sector that's so important to us, making it even more efficient. So it'll be resourcing things like uh, or, or, or looking for excellence in underground mining, looking for excellence in uh, truck management, looking for excellence in artificial intelligence to run those trucks. And on and on it goes. And, and hopefully we'll have the medical side of it there too, you know, with uh, looking at black lung disease. And so it, it has an enormous future. So we're, we're, we're going to open that in May next year. It's well underway right now. The contract has been let. And so that's, a, that's quite exciting for the resource sector in our area. And for Australia, actually, we'll have the Australian Centre for Resource Excellence here in Mackay. And uh, I think that's that's really good that it's going to be based here. So it w- whose idea was that? Was that a council idea, initiative? Well, no, that comes out of the community. And the community is really, um, you know, the resource industry network. We have some really good uh, stakeholder organisations in our region. And the resource industry network had been talking for a long time about a centre of excellence here in Mackay. And so they teamed up with us and we put in uh, an application. We auspiced the application uh, for the, the state election, and that was successful. But, of course, when you go and do the studies on these things, on the engineering design and the costings, it was uh, twice as much as what we thought it was going to be initially, so council had to put up the uh, the rest of the money. So it's about $7.5 million worth of uh, building that we're going to put up. And that'll be stage one. Stage two, you know, can follow down the track as we expand and get into the other areas of the resource industry that we need to apply some excellence to. And so we, we aim to be... You know, making the industry more efficient, making it more productive, you know, making the jobs, uh, fulfilling the jobs of the future, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and what we can do for the industry to drive not just profitability but safety and uh, and a much better use of the resource. Yes. And it's going to be really good to see. Watch it. Whereabouts is it in Paget exactly? It's uh, it's near the council's depot. Cross, it's our land actually. It's across the, the road from the council depot at Paget. Yep. So down near the uh, the, the recycling centre. Oh yes. Uh, and so it's you know it's quite centrally located, and it'll be very very handy for all of those businesses in Paget. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, thanks so much for your time, Greg. It's I really think that everything that you have shared 
in such an eloquent way compared to me going, we just need mining, you can't just stop it, you know. <laughs> it's, I, knew that, I knew you'd have all the, all the right words. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to share that I haven't quite covered about no, well, mining in our industry, I th- I in think, our town? I think you've, uh, I think you've covered it and, and you do an important job for the industry sector it's, as well. I mean, it's a hard sector to talk about. Because there, there is a need. There is a need for the world to focus on sustainable energy. We all know that. But that sustainable energy future is quite a way off at the moment because we just can't, we can't store it. We, can't, we, can, we might be able to produce it, but I don't think anybody wants to see uh, a whole land mass full of windmills right up and down the Queensland coast, nor do we want to see the whole of inland Australia turned into glass. There has to be a, 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 more, a more sustainable way of producing a sustainable future. And, and that will come, you know, and, and, and I agree with you. I want these young people to, to stick around in school to make sure that they get the smarts to, uh, to get us out of this in the next generation because it'll come. It'll, you know, the ability to store it, the ability to use hydrogen safely, uh, it's got to be there. And so we just need to discover it right now. But in the meantime... Let's make the best use we possibly can of the best coal that we've got right here on our doorstep and make sure that, you know, if it's got to be burnt, then they're burning the best stuff. And in terms of the best metallurgical coal, we've got that too. So that's what comes out of our region in in 80% of what comes out of our region, metallurgical coal. So when somebody invents the coal or the, the whatever it is to take the place of coal to make steel – they'll make a squillion dollars, but mm. it's not there yet. Well, I always tend to harp back to the little things in in my life as I've grown up when they said that you'd be able to go to a wall, a hole in the wall, and get money out. I was like, as if you can do that. <laughs> and then what about going and putting your own shopping through and paying for it yourself? And now we hardly even have cash anymore. And it it, it, it just seemed so ridiculous and... Uh, you know, in out of a cartoon or something, and now it's just so easy. So things change. We all know that. So I agree that let's hope that something comes. Well, I don't. I don't. I think it's a lot more than just hope. You know, we we are changing our techno- Belief. technology Belief. Yeah. Uh, at an, an increasingly rapid rate, and the, the technology that we've amassed over the last, or the information that we've amassed over the last twelve months. You know that would have taken twenty or thirty years to do beforehand. And when you think of, when you think of just the mobile phone, you know that how far that's come. I mean, my my mm-hmm. first use of a mobile phone was in nineteen eighty eight, and it was the size of a small suitcase, <laughs> and it had a wonderful battery life of twenty minutes. <laughs> and now, and all it could do was phone people, you know. And now, of course, you you've got access to the world and a mm. small computer in your hand. Just imagine where we're going to be in the next ten years. So that's that's my belief rather than hope. I, I am absolutely sure that we will reach a solution for this in a short space of time uh, in our lifetime and the, and the kids are going to be part of that. The kids are at school right now are going to be part of that and we will be able to deliver a sustainable future. Love it. Let's just throw to our esteemed Jacob in the background. Did you have anything that we haven't covered that you would like to ask our mayor? So can we do it in Sure, yeah. Yep. Now for a word from our sponsor, Julia Hartman and the Bantax Accounting Group. Julia's my awesome accountant. She's written two books with financial expert Noel Whitaker, and she's got a passion to help us miners make the most out of our hard earned cash. She's got heaps of tips and make sure that we get every cent we are meant to get and is right on the ball with everything. If you head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners, that's B-A-N-T-A-C-S, you can download a free booklet all just for us miners. And there's also a spreadsheet in there that helps you check off what tools you have for your trade, like your isolation lock, work boots, seven shirts, all of these sorts of things, and you can weigh them up and it'll tell you if you qualify weight-wise to claim your trips out to work. And that's just one of the things that they've got over there. So I strongly urge you to head to bantax.com.au forward slash miners 
and see what they can do and find your nearest office as we come up to tax time. They're really on the ball, know what's going on with the tax department and there's heaps of other free information like property investing. If you really plan on doing some great things with your money, you want to do that, right? If you want to sell your house, you can save a lot of money if you find out what to do first rather than in hindsight. And Julia, she'll, you know, make sure you get it right. And if you do it wrong and then go and see her, she'll <laughs> she'll up you <laughs> in the nicest possible way because she really cares about us and wants us to keep our money and not give it to the tax department. Anyway, head over to bantax.com.au forward slash miners and tell them Mad Mumsy sent you. Sure. Yeah. So you have, um, for instance, you have a number of, of um, climatologists, like of scientists, Australians as well, that, see, that says that um, way more action is needed, that it's not, uh, uh, that, you know, that we're not moving swiftly enough. Do you agree with that, or what is your opinion on that? Well, I think any action that we take towards a sustainable future, towards, you know, towards tackling climate change has got to be taken. Uh, but we've, you've, you've actually got to make sure that you measure that action and it can't be, it can't be emotively driven. So we, as I said before, you know, you, if, if Tokyo was powered by today's sustainable power and they had six weeks of a typhoon, typhoon weather, there's not enough batteries in the world to store the power to just power one city. So... You know, when we're talking about a sustainable future, when we're talking about climate change being a contributor to that, there is there is no doubt that man-made carbon is contributing to the Earth's atmosphere, whatever whatever it is now. I mean, I don't know you, I don't know the reality of the figures that we see, and they change on a regular basis about how how the Earth is going to heat up. Um, but there's no doubt that there is substance to climate change and so as a as a world community not politicians not one political side against the other as a world community we need to focus on it and when and we obviously need our best our best academics thinking about it uh, are you concerned about the changes that are that is happening to the climate i'm concerned from the fact that we are are a coastal community we have 31 beach beaches in our Mackay Regional Council footprint and and 24 of those have communities right on the beachfront. So what we've seen in uh, cyclonic action in the last couple of years has been some massive erosion of, uh, of the land, of the beaches and of course that's starting to intrude on public and domestic housing and, and so that, that is a concern for us. Am I concerned about the the overall uh, future? You know, I think concern is concern is a, is got to be tempered by the fact that as a local authority, we've just we've just got to tackle what we can deal with, and and what we are dealing with at the moment is some eroding beaches and some beaches that are accreting, some beaches that are actually getting bigger. Uh, so it's not all the same, you know. So. We are certainly seeing some more intense weather conditions than we've seen than we've seen in a lifetime. Doesn't mean to say it's never happened in Australia. In the two hundred years or two hundred and forty odd years that you know white settlement has been in Australia, that's the records, the basic records that we've got. But there's there's instances of uh, sea rises and storm surges that go back, you know, maybe eight or nine hundred years that we can see the deposits on cliff tops in the northern parts of Queensland. That uh, of seashells and 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 fish uh, remains, so that's you know this sort of stuff has happened before. The big question for me is: Is it all man-made? Is it part of a cyclic in terms of the weather patterns? Because the weather has warmed up and cooled down in Earth's history many times before. Uh, so whereabouts are we in that cycle, and how much is man contributing to it? There's no doubt that if what, what, whatever we can do to reduce our carbon emissions, we should do as a world community. We shouldn't be politicising this whole thing. We should be talking about it sensibly. And that means taking the emotion out of it because the, immediately you get somebody saying, 
on one side and a very we got to stop coal mining because we're all going to die it's all you know the emotion on that side begets emotion on the other side that'll trot out some other side of saying this is all rubbish and so and so instead of having a a sensible discussion we end up with this very emotive two-sided political discussion that doesn't get the world community anywhere so as a community we need to have a sensible discussion about it, and that sensible discussion has got to involve all levels of our community. And uh, last question. Um, you talked about, you know, that this is an, um, an issue that needs to be solved over the next couple of generations, and you also talked about the protesters, you know, I guess you're referring to the, uh, the pupils striking from schools on Fridays. Um, one of their points, or their main point, and a lot of scientists' main point is that action is actually needed now that you know that the the world community is acting way too slowly and that you should actually you know cut down on coal and 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 other pollutants at a lot faster level than you're doing right now what is what do you say to that i understand what the students are saying uh it's all right to say well we should cut down on coal but tell us how tell us how In Stockholm, you're going to turn the lights out and save on energy, which cuts down on coal on coal burning or saves save on carbon production. Tell us how you're going to do that in London or Tokyo or Beijing. Nobody is talking sensibly about that yet, and that's the sort of the emotion that I'm saying is in the argument. Anybody can say we should cut down on coal because you know my future is in doubt and and my children aren't going to grow in the world that I know. Let us talk sensibly about how we do it. And there's no discussion about that at the moment. China is one of the biggest pollutants in the world, followed by the United States and then and then by Russia. You know, here in Australia, we produce 0.05 or 0.5 percent. I can't remember what it is, but it's a very minuscule percentage of the carbon footprint in this world that the 25 million Australians produce. And and we, you know, we are doing what we what we can do in terms of us as a first world nation being able to contribute to the world and contribute to this discussion. If if the world's young people really want to do something about it, then we you know, we've got to in, we've got to encourage the major pollutants in, in the world. And as I said, that's you know China and the United States and Russia, and then followed by a few other uh, you know, of the larger countries in Europe, than the EC the EC the European Economic Union, uh, for instance. You know what's happening there to actually curb the lifestyles that we're used to and is the population ready to curb the lifestyles that we're used to and I'd say in the first world they're not because there's no there's no obvious solution you cannot say to a population in a democratic country you cannot say well you can't turn the lights on on Thursday night and Friday night or Saturday night this week because we're conserving electricity and because we're doing that we're going to produce x amount or less carbon footprint that government would be out gone So we need we need to have a sensible discussion about what we can do. So we we had a look at the carbon footprint. So when you when you're talking about a carbon footprint, the carbon footprint of a coal mine in central Queensland, just out outside of us, is about a quarter of the carbon footprint of the same sort of square kilometer in Melbourne. So bef- before we start aiming at the world community who who they say are causing all of this, let's aim at some of the areas that actually produce a huge amount of carbon. What are we doing about stopping cars driving all that way in every major city in the world? Where's the public transport system that will get a million cars off the road next year? Those are the sorts of sensible solutions that we need to be talking about, and they require money. They require absolute leadership from from governments all over the world. But nobody's talking about that. The the short simple answer is let's stop coal and it'll all be over. Well, it'll all be over, all right, because there'll be riots around the world because the lights won't be on. And so let's let's get a solution that's based on real outcomes rather than the emotions that we have at the moment. You happy with that? You got a thumbs up there, man. <laughs> Thank you. You oh, you can really hear your talking about let's get the emotions out of it but I I can feel your passion for um, especially for our community and I know it I see on the news all the time and I've met you and everything but um, that's what we need 
we need passionate people who are trying to talk about let's try and do something about it and find find the solutions and not be hopeful for a solution I love that let's believe that the solutions are coming and I I choose to believe that with you Mayor today well well, I believe it yeah I'm the eternal optimist though but I I mean I believe it and uh, and that's what that's what a, a non-emotive look at it. Mm. I know one young, I know one young person who's going through university right now, and we went and visited her recently, and she was just so well. It doesn't matter. The world's stuffed anyway. We're either going to blow it up or it's going to burn. Like what? <laughs> well, why are you going to university? <laughs> you might as well just go and have some fun, love. You know, and and it's no. sad to see a generation of people. That seem not all of them, no, but not, they just seem to be them. very doom and gloom. Yes, have your passion, have your let's try and do our part in the world, but still try and have a bit of fun, guys. You know, because then when you sometimes when you step away from it, like when you try and do something on computer, it's not working. Step away from the problem, go for a walk, go on holiday. That's when the answers come. So maybe for some of these young people, that is one. They just need to release the and. The answer might just come well, into that person. That's called growing up, though, isn't it? So we've yeah, all been there. We've yeah, all been that understand. passionate at university. We've all been uh, that driven. Yeah, and uh, and then you get out into the real world and, <laughs> but I and think, you get a mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> but I think as young people, too, they don't just want us old people to say, oh, yeah, they're just young. They'll be right when they grow up. You know, they've still got their passion. But oh, um, I'm just saying if they just release the grip for a little bit, that's some really of the important. answers might be able to funnel through. Passion is really important. Mm, yeah. And, and, and I think that's what makes the world go round. We've got mm-hmm. young people who uh, want to demonstrate that passion all the time. And uh, right at the other end of the scale, we've got old fogies uh, like me who can still get passionate, uh, but, you know, have had some life experience. Absolutely. And you know that, you know, you know what needs to happen, that, but there's got to be a work a workable solution, and there's got to be people talking about it unemotively and, and making sure that we're all heading in the right direction. And I believe that's going to happen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just in closing, before we let you go and we head off to our wonderful pageant and mm-hmm. Haypoint, um, life can get tough at times, and I'm sure the pressures you as Mayor are under, like TV cameras in your face and microphones and get the right answer out there, uh, as well as staying true to your values. Um, so you're under a lot of pressure. What is the special place that you go to when life turns to crap? How do you, Greg, personally handle your tough times? Uh, well, I thank God for the invention of red wine. <laughs> <laughs> From South Australia. <laughs> <laughs> From South Australia. No, well, look, you know, I, I try to, uh, to moderate life so that you don't, get, you don't let yourself get into that super stressed situation because all jobs are stressful you know all, all jobs have their ups and downs and and for me I, I just like to uh, unwind you know late at night after I've got home from a function with a glass of red wine and um, and look at a bit of um, television and and then on when I get the occasional half a day on a weekend I just like to get out and do some yard work and mow the yard and you know, do the pool whatever it is and and you don't have you can empty all of that stuff out of your head and you don't have to think about anything for half yeah. a day and and when that's a good unwind it certainly is thank you so much greg it's pleasure. been a pleasure lovely to talk to you you too see thank you land. bye cheers well what about that hey oh i can't believe how passionate our mckay mayor was and Surprisingly, I was also very impressed with his openness to the future and what might happen in the next few generations. So I think it was a great conversation and hopefully most of it will be shared over in Denmark. But, you know, if they've only got an hour and they've got to show the Broken Hill people, the farmer and the Royal Flying Doctors and us. So a lot of what was recorded won't go on and hopefully <laughs> it'll be all the crap bits that don't make it but not from the mayor sorry mayor I mean um me rabbiting on as we're driving through Paget and stuff with my bad side looking at him it it changed me at my core 
doing this. It's certainly given me uh, so much more belief in myself and in my passion for our industry and also for um, the openness to what is yet to come. We don't have the answers now. And as we shared in that interview, I won't go over it all again with you. Um, I'm excited to see what the universe unfolds for us. And hopefully the protesters don't get too out of hand. You know, we don't want it to end up like Hong Kong is at the moment with all their protesting. I can understand their reasons and I can understand protesters here or wherever, you know, you have your passions and your reasons, but that's all just, as I said in that interview, quite a lot. Drop it down a peg, take a breath, and let's see if we can let some nuances come through. So anyway, that's enough on that from me. Thank you to Greg, the mayor, my new friend. It was so funny, I said to him, you've got one job. I think I, I think I actually left that in the interview. You've got one job to make sure that we get a selfie. And I was lucky, well, I decided to ask Jacob to please take a couple of photos of us, which you can find along with a video of us swizzled up from our trip out to Haypoint and stuff at the show notes, madmumsy.com forward slash beer 62. After our big day, my new friends Jacob and Mass flew to Sydney and then on to Broken Hill, straight away after the barbecue pretty much. They were going to hang out with a farmer and then a couple of days with the flying doctors. Oh, they would love that. I know Mass will, the videographer dude, getting up there. Who needs a drone when you got a plane, right? Luckily, I warned them daylight saving was starting that day or they might have missed their flight. Or... <laughs> I'm not sure how it works, which end of the daylight saving part does what, but uh, they might have been two hours early and after the epic adventure that they'd already been on here in Mackay and just getting here, I thought they didn't need it. And lucky I did share it with them because they didn't know. Anyway, that's enough from me. Be sure to go to the show notes to see all the links that we spoke about and um, in case you didn't know there's a Facebook group Beers with a Minor podcast where I share pictures and live broadcasts and stuff just before I'm about to do an interview and anything related to the podcast so it's slowly growing we're up to we hit 150 members this week um, I felt like I sat on 30 for ages so 150 is a huge milestone but more importantly it's a way for you to come behind the scenes and know a bit more about what's happening with the beers with minor podcast hit me up on all the social medias as at mad mumsy m-u-m-z-i-e and i'll uh talk to you next week next time it's never next week right usually next month the way i'm going um until next time Stay safe, be real, be special, and have fun, for we only live once. Cheers.